Hi everyone, welcome to today's video. Um, if you haven't seen the last video on a bit of an overview on gout, be sure to check that one out. In this video, we're going to go over um, acute gout. We're going to touch upon chronic gout. Uh, we're going to go over presentation, investigations, management, and uh, prevention as well. So let's get into it. Causes. So what causes hyperuricemia or increased serum uric acid? Generally, we can categorize them into three categories. So th three causes are drugs, um, an increased cell turnover, and also a decreased secretion of uric acid. Under the category of drugs, so we have certain medications that can increase the amount of uric acid in an individual and thus cause gout. So you may be more familiar with uh, diuretics, so such as thiazides, there are also other medications that can cause um, gout, so cytotoxics, ethambutol. And then we move on to causes that increase cell turnover. So here you have things like lymphoma, leukemia, certain uh, other diseases such as psoriasis, hemolysis, and muscle necrosis. And then the third category is where there's decreased secretion. So primary gout, um, chronic renal failure, lead nephropathy, hyperparathyroid. Another way to categorize things is primary gout versus secondary gout. So those can be um, the two ways we can categorize what causes gout. Primary gout is related to under excretion or overproduction of uric acid and it's often associated with a mix of dietary excesses um, or alcohol overuse and metabolic syndrome. When we're talking about secondary gout, so this is related to things like medications or conditions that cause hyperuricemia, like we mentioned a few moments ago. Now that we went over causes of hyperuricemia, um, we'll just go over some predisposing factors that we went over in the last video on gout. So things like surgery, family history, obesity, high purine diet, uh, polycythemia, leukemia, diuretics, acute infection, and so on. Here we have now our acute gout, so our, an acute presentation of gout. So it's painful, swollen joint, usually affecting the big toe. It can also affect the feet and the ankles also um, commonly can be affected. Um, we have red skin, which may peel um, over top of the uh, inflamed joint, as well as a fever can be present. It can be polyarticular, meaning affecting multiple joints, especially in the elderly. Um, one thing in our differential diagnosis that we need to be conscious of is that it may mimic septic arthritis, which is quite the emergency, and we do need to be mindful of that. Now let's move on to investigations. So there isn't really much investigating to do when it comes to um, gout, but let's go over a few of them. So blood test, generally the first thing we do, and here we'll find an increased white cell count, an increased ESR, or sedimentation rate, and increased urate, although this may be normal. So just be mindful of this. Um, blood tests are going to come in handy as well when we uh, do them in the future if we start preventative medication, prophylactic medication. Imaging, like x-rays. Not usually required, I'm going to be honest with you. It can show a bit of soft tissue swelling, um, but might show some erosion um, patterns in severe disease. But generally, it's not usually required, and uh, it's not something that you do routinely. Maybe you'll do it if you're wondering if there's an alternative diagnosis, perhaps, or something like that. And then we have microscopy of synovial fluid. Again, not usually required, but if, if by some chance uh, it's happening, it's going to reveal sodium monoureate crystals um, on a polarized light microscopy. All right, let's go over some management now. Management of acute gout. So it should resolve in a couple weeks, less than two weeks, often after you know two to seven days if, uh, if it's treated. So there's a few things to, uh, to do here when we're managing gout. So there's a lifestyle component, and then there's a medication component. Now, before any of that, 
we have to exclude infection. That's number one. Number two is rest and elevate the joint, apply ice packs, things like that. Medication, NSAIDs are helpful. So non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like ibuprofen, naproxen, um, just be cautious if there's any GI problems. Alternatively, if NSAIDs are contraindicated or they're not really doing the trick, then you can try something like colchicine. Um, that can sometimes help. Just be wary of side effects like vomiting, diarrhea, nausea. And then if that's not working, then you can move on to things like steroids, right, which can be quite effective and uh, usually safe if the prior two things don't really work. Moving on to lifestyle. So prevention of further attacks. That's very important. We don't want to be having attacks all the time, so let's try to prevent them. Lose weight, um, so a weight reduction. Avoid alcohol and purine-rich foods. So what I mean by that is red meats, pulses, muscles, foods like that. Avoid thiazide, diuretics, and aspirin. And then we can also consider prophylactic medication if there are recurrent attacks. So first-line treatment generally is allopurinol. And um, for that, then later on, we will have to check the blood tests again to see if our medication has managed to lower the uric acid levels or not, or if we have to tinker with the, uh, the dose. If allopurinol is not effective or it's not tolerated, then fabuxostat is an alternative. Um, and we can try with that then. And the last thing we have to remember is to treat the individual and not just the gout, right? So there can be uh, associated issues going on with the uh, individual, with the patient. So there can be hypertension, there can be diabetes, there can be cardiovascular disease. So all these things we need to, we need to address and put it all together and manage the patient as a whole. And the last thing then to mention here is um, chronic gout and pseudo gout. So with chronic gout, there are recurrent attacks, there are tophi or urate deposits happening in the pina, in the tendons, in the joints, and also there's joint damage happening. So when we're getting to the stage of chronic gout, we're already risking that our joints can be um, a little bit more damaged, let's say, and then we're probably looking into the territory of referring this to a rheumatologist. When we talk about pseudogout, also called calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, um, this is an inflammatory arthritis due to deposition of pyrophosphate crystals. So they're not uro urate crystals, but pyrophosphate crystals. It's associated with uh, osteoarthritis, hyperparathyroidism, and hemochromatosis. Pseudogout usually affects large joints, so classically the knee. Um, in older people, so above the age of 50, treatment is largely similar. Um, but the important thing to remember here, I guess, from an exam point of view, would be that there are calcium pyrophosphate crystals, which will form um, basophilic rhomboid crystals under the microscope, as opposed to what we described earlier on with the urate crystals. And there we have it. That's our video on gout. Um, so just kind of to conclude, gout, precipitation of monosodium urate crystals into the joints due to hyperuricemia. The causes we went over, but I would say 90% is due to under excretion and 10% due to overproduction. The crystals under the microscope are distinct. So they're needle shaped. They're uh, yellow crystals. Um, it's more common in men, gout. When we're talking about symptoms, um, classically, remember that um, it's painful, big, toe, so the MTP joint, also called podagra. We can get tophus formation. Um, we spoke about um, acute attacks. We spoke about management. We spoke about pseudo gout and chronic gout as well. Like and subscribe for more. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.